Welcome everyone. Hello, Good to see hello. You. Good to be with you all. It's been a few weeks since we've tuned in with the Yoga Heart Mind community. Oh my goodness, it has been. Uh, sincere apologies that we haven't been uh, uploading much fresh content over the last few weeks. Our children have been quite unwell and it's been school holidays and we've been all in it, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, we have. This has been a no-joke cold and flu season. We are in the Southern Hemisphere, as most of you know, and it is winter and it's almost like on the first of winter we got the flu and it has been rolling on, just sort of accumulating from there. So, yeah, we've been definitely in it and it has opened our hearts just to... Parents with sick kids. I mean, it really sucks. It's so hard. It's real. It, it's one thing when it is yourself, um, but it's another thing when it's it's a it's a little one. So, um, yeah, that's where we have been. But we had a nice trip to Darwin. Got some warmth and sunshine. Definitely don't want to um, victimize ourselves. We've no, got it, it good. No, it's not bad. <laughs> but no. it has been an all-consuming few weeks for. Sure. So again, apologies that we haven't been uploading much fresh content lately, but girls are back to school tomorrow, hopefully. Fingers They're coming crossed. good today. Fingers, Fingers crossed. crossed. And we will get back to um, recording lots of great classes for you all. But today we wanted to focus on the teacher training. A great crew has signed up for it already and we can't wait to connect with you all. But for those that are still wanting a bit more information, wanting to tune into the curriculum a little bit more, we wanted to just pick it apart and discuss it and talk about what is going to be on offer for the training. It feels just so good to us and we've really taken our time in putting it together. And let's, uh, let's dive into it. Well, do you know what's coming up for, mm. for me first and foremost is before we dive into the curriculum I know that a lot of people have connected to me saying this is just not the right time we'll catch it um, next year when you next run it we have been talking to each other and it feels like this could be the only teacher training we do in a little while in a little while we just we don't know we we don't think next year is, is going to year. happen or probably the year after that. So if you are uh, planning on doing the teacher training and this is just not such an ideal time, you may be disappointed hoping to catch it next year and it's not running. So we just mm -hmm. wanted to uh, shine a light on that thought that we've been talking about is like you know what this is a massive amount of work that we are going to be doing it's all consuming for us um, I think it's going to be very manageable for the participants but for us it's going to be um, very time consuming so this one feels it's the one if you're thinking about it this is the one you should do yeah what's What's the yearly cycle after all? We really, Joe and I, with our lifestyle, we of course have our visions and have our goals, but there's also a, a bit of a spontaneity to our lifestyle and a bit of fluidity and just feeling into what is right for the moment, for the year. And this training feels right on for this time coming up. And... Um, we may do it next year. I don't think but so. But it's looking unlikely. Joe's wanting to go back to school and study. So am I, but mainly Joe for now. And um, Why did you say may do it next year? We both said we're not going to do it next year. Well, no, I was more we may. We just don't know. But we most likely won't. No, yeah. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> just to confuse things. <laughs> we most likely will not. But we just... We don't know. But for those of you that have um, responded saying, oh, I just can't fit it in for this year, like Joe said, um, just make it happen. This is it for now. It could happen every two years, could happen every three, could happen every 10. This could be it. Um, 
Another couple uh, questions that keep rolling through are from already teachers that have done like a 200 hour and are wondering if they can just do segments of it, modules of it, 300 hours of it. And our immediate response is no. It's the complete training. It, it is a unique training. It's a rich training. We're putting, we're putting so much into it. It's not, I mean, I could just be biased, but it doesn't feel like a typical linear teacher training where we're just training you to be a teacher. It's a real dharma, sadhana, deep dive, a, a complete lifestyle immersion, which um, we've intended for that, not just to rack up 300 more hours, but to really take a deep dive into our own awakening, our own true sadhana, and earnestly uncover the, the true teacher within. So we have been discussing this for years that 200 hours, it's good, but and 300 hours is good, but we want a really deep, intensive 500 hour. And for us to all go, go on this journey together and as a group talk about it. And so, yeah, if you've been trying to just get the 300 hours from this or just the 200, sorry about that, but it's the, the complete 500 hour. However, what will be open for um, non-teacher trainee participants are the online retreats. So within the teacher training, we will be doing three uh, online retreats, which will be like a Friday to a Sunday where we'll um, really deep dive and uh, rack up some hours and bring in some very special guest teachers. So they will be open registration for anyone to join. So if you did want to just get a little taste of it, that would be a good, uh, a wonderful thing to do. For sure. Any other practicalities and questions that keep coming up that you want to speak to before we dive into the curriculum? I think people ha have, of course, been asking about the Yoga Alliance. And again, we are not going to be Yoga Alliance accredited. It's just not an, an organization that I have been affiliated with that um, I haven't really liked a lot of the things that have gone along with the Yoga Alliance over the years, the direction of it, um, you know, nothing personal. I just don't see value in it personally. Um, if you need something to say that you have done 500 hours of um, training, we will absolutely hand you that. Of course, you're all the, getting a certificate without the, doubt. <laughs> at the end of the year, um, uh, however, it, it's not going to go through Yoga Alliance. So um, I know a lot of you see value in the Yoga Alliance. And, it is pretty common and, now. And though. really want, um, want those registered hours. And again, we do apologize, but that is just not... Um, it seems to be a common choice for yoga schools nowadays oh does uh, it it does right um so it's not an unusual one mm. if you look around a lot of very well established yoga schools um aren't registering with yoga mm. alliance anymore okay. um so it's not unusual if you are fine you're trying to get a teaching job and they're asking that your training be yoga alliance registered i would earnestly chat with them sincerely chat with them tell them who you're training or who you've trained with um, if that is us and most likely if it's an authentic yoga school and they're looking into this real rigorous training that we're going to do and our background Joe and my background and the guest teachers we're going to have as well um, almost without a doubt they will see oh this is a qualified teacher coming on board, right? Well, without a doubt, yeah. but I think I think it leads nicely actually into the first part of our module. So we are going to have just um, 
just to give some structure and organisation to the program, we're going to do it in four modules. And the first, first, first module is Earth. <laughs> the first. The first module is Earth, and um, so this is part of the training where we find ground zero, so to speak, and we're going to do a lot of unschooling. So before we start to fill up on a whole lot of stuff, we, we thought it was very important to let go of some stuff. So this this first module will be um, just clearing the space. We'll be working on uh, talking about purification, cleansing. Um, we'll also be talking about optimal diet and... Regulating the nervous system. Regulating the nervous system, lifestyle choices, things Cultivating like that. beginner's mind. Uh, it's very common in, in more of the... Zen and Buddhist practices of before diving into more of the intellectual, scholarly and even more complicated practices is a, a practice of beginner's mind, a practice of unknowing. So it's like, yeah, we create a, a clear canvas, so to speak, and then, then we can really learn rather than rushing into just collecting more information, collecting more skills. Uh, we want, yeah, to take this first module of unschooling, unknowing and getting ripe, so to speak, really tuning up the nervous system, purifying. Um, I got to admit, these are um, still to this day staples of my practice before getting into sequences and even... Uh, study uh, these purification practices. So, um, of course, we're going to go deeper into that, way deeper in the actual program. But it just feels so important to me in our, especially in our current day and age where we've got so much information at our fingertips. It's incredible. Mm. The amount of teachings, the amount of podcasts, the amount of books we can get seemingly endless information right now from our phones which is so cool but um this feels very important to begin in clearing quietening opening and then we can really ask some big questions and go deep into the learning which um just through us contemplating the training um it came through why we've titled it from learnt knowledge to embodied wisdom that feels really um, timely and appropriate from, from learnt knowledge to embodied wisdom because we do tend to be in, uh, most of us are socialized just to want to collect more hours, collect more knowledge, collect more accolades, collect, 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 getting more and more knowledge and the whole notion of knowledge is power. And there's truth to it, but there's a whole nother shift which we're going to deeply explore of shifting from just just the learnt knowledge into a deeper embodied wisdom so before yeah. before we get there which is the next module i do want to say that this first module of our unschooling or our um cleansing the palate our beginner's mind this typically this step is missed in most teacher trainings because there's just not enough time. You have to just get straight into it because you've got to get your this hours and your that hours. So we, we, we don't have that pressure. We have one day per week for the year to get together to, and, and, and we have our time to do all of these really crucial steps which are going to, by the end of the practice, assure that uh, this stuff really lands deeply and it's not superficial. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say that. And then uh, what Stu was just saying, yes, the, the, the real crux of the practice is to cultivate your own authentic yoga practice. So it's not the practice that you are going to sit and teach a class 
at all. It's not a sequence driven group class. This is your sadhana. This is your spiritual practice. This spiritual practice, uh, physical, mental, <laughs> emotional practice is just going to be for you. And uh, so I think that could be a bit confusing, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. So you, you okay. sound like you're implying this is not about teaching it. It's just about you. Okay. So I want to separate your own home practice, your own sadhana from a class that you're going to teach. Yes, we will get to the class that you're going to teach, but you don't have time in a group class to sit down individually and do this deep work that that we're going to do cultivating our own sadhana. Yeah. Is that confusing? No, got it. Yeah. We're just talking about the first module right now. We're just talking yes. about the first module. And you the f- will end up learning to be a teacher. <laughs> but in the first module, we're clearing, yeah. deepening. Yeah, we're developing a, sel- a, home, a, a self-practice. Yes, yes. totally. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, so this is going to be your um, unique practice, however it evolves over the year and um and uh yeah i think this is going to be again a really exciting part of the practice because what do we have to teach when we haven't really done the work and experienced it for ourselves not a lot you can just become a talking piece of other people but in just spending time authentically developing your own spiritual practice, your own sadhana, from there, naturally, wisdom is going to arise. Naturally, it is going to come out from that experience. So again, this is crucial. This, I think, is completely missed in, a, in the structure of that rushed 200 hours. Um, you're supposed to just do that on your own. Well, it's really hard to do on your own when, when, when you don't have, um, I mean, it can be done on your own, but it can be very confusing and you can waste a lot of time sort of uh, going down some unwanted paths. Whereas if you have a community and you have some mentors, um, we can really shine a light onto mm-hmm. the broader path. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I do see it a lot with younger teachers that have done a 200 hour, really enthusiastic. You can tell it's from more of that model of pretty much being taught a script of teaching an effective class. And that initial enthusiasm of becoming a teacher, teaching a lot. I meet teachers all the time that are burnt out, that are already over it because they've rushed into it. They've rushed into it. Many of them admit they don't have a self-practice anymore. They assumed they would get that uh, hit, that feeling that we love when we practice from teaching, but it's not the case. Teaching, we give a lot of energy. We give a lot of energy. And when we can really deep dive into refining our own self-practice in combination with skilled teaching, it's not as draining. It's not as draining, which we're going to cover as well with skillful set and setting and skillful class preparation and all of that in which um, we can cover some of those common traps that we see a lot with not necessarily younger teachers, but that initial stage of of teaching where there's that initial surge of enthusiasm. I see, we see a lot of burnt out teachers and I do see us uh, helping our students really cultivate that deeper balance from the get-go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so pretty quickly after... Uh and, and, of course, these are not linear, sharp uh, closes and openings to these modules. They will definitely um, bleed and evolve one into the other. So, so then we, we talk about the art of teaching. And, 
Um, so we have here exploring authenticity and confidence. And I think that's that's a, a, a really interesting one to drop into because most of us have in our minds an image of what a teacher is, of what a teacher sounds like, and then we try to emulate that. Of course, that's fine as well, but um, even more fruitful and rich will be just your authentic self. And for a lot of people, that's also also confusing. Like, what is that? Um, so, so we'll we'll have some workshops to really. Um, elicit that and, 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 and pull at those strings and, and find that authentic voice, whatever that is, and sort of, um, again, it's, it's hard to do that on your own, but in a group setting, you can, you can really get some wonderful feedback. We'll be talking about holding space, um, common pitfalls and challenges, working with fears and doubts, languaging, which is also very important. Yeah, that's going to be a great one because, uh, again, coming back to the the title, shifting from learnt knowledge to embodied wisdom, that feels a big part of that shift from teaching from more of a, a script or emulating other teachers that we like into a deeper relaxation, really, a deeper confidence and kind of getting out of our own way. That's what it really feels like rather than being um, overly uh, uptight about um, how this class is going to come off. We're more, there's an easeful confidence where we can just show up and get out of the way and let it flow. But first, one needs to work on yeah that precise languaging, holding space, developing these skills, developing the languaging, and then with practice, which we're going to explore, then you've refined the tools enough to kind of let them go a little, to not need to think about them as much. But of course, thinking's good, but we don't want to just be constantly thinking about it. That's when we can fall into the traps of fear and doubt and perfectionism and comparison uh, we can more just shine from a real authentic confidence which is a beautiful thing beautiful thing we're then going to dive into exploring different yoga styles just so that we all have a good understanding of the terrain so you know yin yoga restorative yoga hatha yoga vinyasa yoga nada yoga kriya yoga And more, I'm sure, Bhakti just yoga. sort of, uh, well, we've got a whole module on, on yes. Bhakti, so we've sort of left that out. But um, yeah, again, just so that, just so that we, we're all really familiar about the landscape because a lot of people are confused about the difference between yin yoga or restorative yoga or hatha yoga or vinyasa yoga. And the terms are changing quite rapidly. So in this moment, we will um, just sort of dive in to, again, yeah, just sort of clarify the landscape a bit there. And then that will bring us to our on-light retreat immersion. So we're going to have three of these in the year and this is an opportunity for us as teacher trainings to have more of an immersive experience up until this point we're just doing our um one class session a week and then you will be doing uh, a self-study and also some work with a partner but we'll not have this sort of like a retreat, I want to say like ashram style experience of what the immersions will be. So the immersions will be um, multiple hours throughout the day to really drop in and um, hopefully go into some deeper places. If you can't make them, everything will be available to watch back in your leisure and I think there's going to be a lot of that because at the moment we are 
quite a worldwide group, um, people all over the place. So I think that's there'll be a lot of that, which is just one of the elements of this type of a training where we can uh, it's very cool that we can all come together in different places but finding a time that aligns for everyone will be a little bit difficult yeah but there'll be plenty of opportunities to check in i want to start a you did a facebook group for your last thing i i understand a lot of people aren't on facebook these days i was mm. thinking more of a telegram th uh, group that people can tune into the group and connect and update one another that feels more universal than facebook these days to me so we'll look into that but um a big part of this is that connectivity even if you can't do any of these live um we really want you to feel connected to us and the group and there'll be plenty of opportunities to um, connect in on more of that personable and live level. We will be putting this on the Thinkific platform and there will be opportunity to discuss on that platform as well. Right. So, so cool. there will be that. Okay, so after our um, first online retreat, that will then mark the end of module one and module two is our water module. And this is where we will um, bring in our anatomy and physiology, functional movement um, portion of the training. Big shout out to my brother, Cam. And He's going to be... Uh a big part of this training. You'll be meeting up with him once a month, at least once a month to really go deep into anatomy and physiology. And then uh, guest teacher, Leslie Kamenoff. Yeah, so Cam is a physiotherapist mm -hmm. and he walks, walks, <laughs> works a lot with athletes and has quite a, a unique skill set. And I think... Um, very functional to bring into the yoga space. Very fun. It feels optimum to me. I, again, I'm biased, but he does have a very comprehensive skill set. Again, he, he does work with athletes, but with his clinic, he also works with anyone and everyone. So it's a really like if you've got injuries, if you've got things you um, feel like uh, a limiting your physical yoga practice. He's, he's just great for that. Very, very functional. And he teaches weekly, um, twice a week at least. Uh, not not movement class. technically a yoga class, but it's a movement class that is pretty much a yoga class. He's been practicing with us for since I began teaching and um, he comes to all of our things, we collaborate. So he's really tuned into the way Joe and I teach. He is an earnest student of ours as well, as well as a, an ally and a colleague and, and our brother. So it's a real honor to have him doing the anatomy and physiology and, and way more, even just the movement practices you'll do with him. Uh, they're great. They're really well-structured classes and that's going to be great. Yeah, we will be working off Leslie Kamenoff and a Amy Matthews' book, Yoga Anatomy. There is a uh, new edition. I think it's the third edition. and um, Second. Oh, is it? I think it's second. Oh, okay. You could be right, but I think it's second. Yeah. But we'll give you the book list. New, new edition anyway, and it's and it's um it's fabulous. And I have spoken to Leslie, and he said that um he would love to also dr jump on sort of three quarters of the way through the training to do a, a live Q and A with us all, and um you know there we can address him personally on um whatever whatever comes up so that's lovely um love the leslie kamenoff of course yoga posture lab uh again and again we will be coming back to the fact that our yoga practice is way beyond just the postures 
because it is. And often that's the main fixation is that yoga is just the asanas, just the postures. So again and again, we're going to be going way deeper than just the postures. At the same time, we're going to go deep into how a potent application of the postures, the asanas is um, uh, such an important part of the sadhana, of the practice. That's going to be a big component. Yes, it will be. Um, and a fascinating look at where we are now also, I guess you can say politically with yoga postures because definitely when I first came into, uh, came up against yoga postures, there was only one way and uh, it was very strict and now it's evolved so much mm -hmm. and almost so that that it's hard to pinpoint down what we're actually doing so right. that's going to be a um a really interesting lab for sure mm -hmm. meditation lab will go into the history of meditation tantric meditation vipassana mindfulness zochen yoga nidra and metta to name a few Again, these uh, different styles will be sort of highlighted throughout the year, but we'll be definitely covering a lot of different meditation techniques. And within your own sadhana, um, cultivation, you can find what works for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm particularly excited for this meditation I mean, we've like we've talked about a lot. We've had the privilege and just such such a gift to spend time with these great teachers w that have brought together. Like I'm talking about the Ramdas retreats in particular, where we've got these yogis and these bhaktas and uh, Buddhist teachers bringing together all these various meditation techniques that all complement one another i really am so grateful for that because it, it it doesn't have to be just one prescribed meditation technique or just one method we can go deep into all of these different types of meditation and be very um adaptable very versatile very functional in daily life in feeling when it's a time for a more stillness practice feeling into when it's time for more of a living meditation natural meditation it it feels very um very balanced to dive into all these different types of meditation it's yeah, gonna be great i i'm very excited uh we have a wonderful guest teacher daniel simpson who will be doing the history and philosophy component of the course and he has a wonderful um, uh, video course that he's going to run over four weeks. And after each video, we will have a live Q&A with Daniel. So you will be able to ask him questions in real time. We'll be working off his um, lovely book that he published, I think, two years ago. The Truth of Yoga, which I found such a great te text, so so uh, simplified of such a complex um, history. <laughs> it's complex. It's confusing. It still is I'm for us. confusing it... myself just trying to explain it. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. It is... Um... It is confusing. It is rich. It is multifaceted. It's so deep. There's many different opinions, many different approaches. So, yeah, he, his approach is very um, refreshing, very simplified, very refreshing, very humble. Yes. Oh, if you haven't come across Daniel Simpson, those of you doing the training, or not anyone actually, you will love his teachings. He's a, um, yes, a very humble and earnest scholar and I, I'm really excited to be working with him. Mm -hmm. 
So this will bring us to our second online retreat immersion with special guests. We also we have had the amazing Lama Surya Das say that he would uh, love to drop in and do some um, some time with us all, which is very exciting. We haven't we haven't confirmed anyone, have we? We haven't we haven't spoken about who's confirmed. We who haven't. We've got confirmed. No, we'll anyway, confirm so we'll, all that soon. But we'll it's going to be great guests. We'll and... keep that on the down low. But um, yeah, he's I, confirmed. Lama Surya Das is confirmed. Surya but we'll have some other guests for the re- immersion retreat as well. Again, just uh, these, and I think that these will be the highlights of the training these deep immersions where you get to get out of the ordinary and into the real um depths of the practice Mm -hmm. yeah and uh i'm also excited for you all to really create a sanctuary out of your home whether you're in a share house and you've only got a little corner to work with you can make that corner so charged and so beautiful. I've got flashbacks to when I was in share houses and when I was staying at my mum's house or just staying at random places where I just had my mat there, altar there, and just going deep. And I'm really excited for you all. Yeah, candles and (laughs) incense and (laughs) stones and crystals and, you know, I... I um I overdo it a bit with everything I do, so uh, I definitely took it that way. But um, it's a great thing to yeah. create that that go to place for your practice that you can then create everywhere you go, <laughs> which is what we do. Module three is our fire module, and this is where we will be bringing in the bhakti. And of course, Stu and I have talked a lot about the fact that we were the most unlikely bhaktas to ever come about. We both had an aversion to any type of chanting and dancing and whatnot. Uh, But here we are just totally in love with the whole bhakti practice. And and so this this is like the mainstay of our practice at the moment, the bhakti. So we'll bring in the life and teachings of Ram Das and Neem Karoli Baba, teachings of devotion, cultivating a devotional practice, kirtan chanting, deity worship and the power of the sangha. Yeah, it is interesting because when I first started yoga, I was completely fixated on the physical practice, completely could even say repulsed by chanting. I I, I would not. So if any of you are um, really keen on this training, but it's coming to this bhakti and you're like, oh, chanting, really? Like you're rolling your eyes. Just bear with us and and play with it. Because from what we have both found with the power of the voice and sound and just, just being in the vibe of... So for me, just being, even when I was adverse to it and not wanting to, there was a subtle little weird um, thing opening, heart opening, mind opening that kept bringing me back to it, even though it was uncomfortable and it made me shy, it made me tense. I was very self-conscious of my voice. It has been the most powerful practice is making sound and chanting and and these devotional bhakti practices so yeah again and again we're going to be talking about Ram Das uh, exploring his teachings uh, reminiscing and sharing of experiences we had with him and we'll bring on some guests for this module as well and yeah this is going to be a big part of it because it's been so life-changing and potent for us. And personally, I see it all the time, how opening and liberating it is when people finally do open up their voice and open up this devotion. 
because we are in an interesting time with a lot of um, people in our current times, in our culture anyway. I don't know about you all, but for many of us, we've seen the kind of uh, negative pitfalls of a lot of religions, which then maybe got us a bit cynical about devotion. It can feel like there's some religious... Uh, culty. Culty type flavors to it. I've definitely felt that. Brainwashy. With the bhakti type <laughs> stuff. Like, oh, this feels a bit culty, religious-y. Like, I don't know, but it's just not. It's just not. I, no. I was actually listening to Alan Watts talking about that in a discussion Um of course, he's dead, but I was listening to one of his talks last night um, about that difference. And there is a difference. Um, so we invite you into exploring this bhakti devotional aspect and um, just with a, like an open book and just explore. Let's go on an adventure of, of the heart, really. A very important part of any teacher training uh now more than ever is a trauma-informed teaching element. So we're going to have that with a beautiful guest teacher, Lisa Danilchuk. And Lisa and I actually did our yoga teacher training together back in 2003 mm. in Santa Monica. So um, she's been doing some amazing work since then. She has her own uh, trauma-informed yoga center in the Bay Area. And um, so we will be talking about the neurobiology of trauma, concepts of transference and projection, um, yoga for trauma, and the intersection between clinical speak and yoga speak. So that's going to be a uh, uh, a lovely one for us to just upgrade our skill set and, and be more aware of who is coming to our classes and how we can best serve them. Yeah, I'm looking forward to learning from her myself. That's going to be great. Yeah, it will be. Mm -hmm. Then then we get into the nuts and bolts, the, the art, art of sequencing. Of sequencing. The so arc we'll, of a yoga class. Yes, and the flow of transitions and when and how to use music and um, the vinyasa krama, sort of like building to a peak pose type of ladder practice. And, you know, it's interesting because we're not bringing this in until the third module and we deliberated about it and just thought that, you know, there's so much that needs to be done before we start to curate a class. There's so much that needs to be done before we understand why we're doing what we're doing. I remember I had an existential crisis in a class one time where I... I lost touch with why I was doing what I was doing. What was I even doing? What was it? What was I even teaching? You know, I totally lost touch with that thing. And, um, you know, it sort of had become more and more acrobatic and outlandish and just, just sort of became a little bit of entertainment. And, and I saw that it wasn't serving anyone, um, at all. I saw that people were getting injured. I saw that people who did have injuries, this was not helping them at all. And, you know, I, I, I became lost. So, um, and that's because I did not develop all of these other foundational things before I jumped into that part of teaching. So, um, yeah. So It's good that you share that. I think it's a very common plateau for a lot of teachers, yeah. it was a it was a plateau for me as well, and but it, it's a good plateau, but it can be a scary one. So it's going to be good to yeah address that. And again, we deliberately put it a little bit later in the training, so we've already created space for it. It feels like that's going to be very helpful. And of course, uh, just in that sharing alone comes wisdom in how yeah we can really create a skillful class that can tailor to everyone and anyone 
Yeah. yeah. Talking about wisdom, next we will have a sans- Sanskrit component with a lovely guest teacher, Cindy Toghill. Um, Cindy is one of the most earnest yogis I have ever met. She gets up at 4 a.m. and sits on her mat and chants. She chants all day, every day, um, and has been studying Sanskrit for about 10 years or more. So she's going to be taking us through the origin of the language, the reason for learning, alphabet practice, which is uh, which is v- very difficult and there are so many different nuances to the language, different mouth positions and just that alone we could work on for a year and um, still not get it down. So so we don't have that down. We, it's, it's, so for Cindy, that is her yoga. That's that, her yoga. That's her practice. Yeah. Our other friends we've got as well, that's their practice. Sorry about the helicopter up there. Helicopter. <laughs> Just wait for that to pass. Oh, it's right there. It's right over here. So, yeah, with the Sanskrit, uh, we're definitely not masters of that but we have a deep curiosity of it we definitely know there's a there's a like the bhakti there's a potency to these sounds and this sanskrit alphabet is just so mysterious and beautiful and potent so without a doubt with cindy you'll all have a nice uh deep dive into how powerful this language is and how how we can incorporate it even just uh As I talk about it, just thinking of the subtlety of how the tongue brushes across the upper palate, uh, that's a big part of it, is every sound can be awakening. It's so cool. It's Mm. amazing. We will already have uh, dived a little bit into mantra practice, but Cindy is going to do mantra practice with classical intonation and tone. So there is a classical way of uh, doing mantra that's sung in a particular way with a particular tone. So we'll be doing a couple of mantras with her in that classical way. Um, But whereas the bhakti style and um, the the individual mantra, we won't be adhering to that classical style. So just knowing knowing that there um, there are different ways to chant mantra. This will bring us to our third and final online retreat immersion with special guests. And again, um, one, two, or all of these retreats are open to anyone, not just our teacher trainees, but uh, in particular, those of you who are doing the teacher training Uh, One will build on top of the next. And by the time we get to this third one, I I feel some of you will be experiencing some real transformation. Uh, Like it's a process. It is a process. And... with any journey, a training is a journey. With any journey, you start off with so many questions and doubts and, and um, you know, you almost regress a little bit before you progress. And, and, and it's magical how it happens. But um, mm. I feel like by the time we get to this final training uh There'll there'll start to be some r- real light bulb mo- moments, and um, and I can't wait to be a part of it all. Mm-hmm. I really can't wait. Yeah. We will go into our fourth module, and our air module, and we will then get into the um, the subtleties, the subtle body chakras, uh, nadis, prana, granthis. Jnana Yoga. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were continuing. 
<laughs> there was a pause. And and so 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 we've we've waited until the final part of the training to bring all this in. Because there needs to be a a real subtlety of attention in order to really earnestly um, explore these elements and the foundations that will be built through the first three quarters of the practice I think will really lay the fertile ground for us to have some substance when diving into this rather than them be sort of a bit airy fairy and new agey Mm -hmm. Like, like we, we'll be really be able to point to and 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 feel into these elements in in a real way, rather than them be completely theoretical. Yes, yeah. I'm glad you said that. That is very common, kind of going into a bit of fantasy land and um, this conceptual fixation on on the subtle body and the and the chakras it's very very common yet when done progressively like this uh, deepening and unfolding it's magnificent having a direct experience of the subtle body which is indescribable that's part of the um the challenge in and that's why we're putting it way later is experiencing the subtle body can't really be learnt or done in that in the same way that we learn most things it's not conceptual it's more of a a ripening so like we began with the cleansing practices and the releasing and then the learning And then the unlearning, you'll see it is cyclical and progressive. And as we deepen these yoga practices, gradually it just organically clears space for a direct experience of the subtle body. And um, it's magnificent because this subtlety of this ground of our being, this prana, this central axis of the chakras uh it is the core of our being it is this kind of final frontier of what we're all looking for in a feeling of joy a feeling of love a feeling of contentment like it's there but it's so subtle it's here but it's so us that um yeah this is gonna be great this is one of my favorite parts of the yoga practice Naturally, this is mainly what I teach in a class just because it feels so important. It feels so, it's what we're all looking for is this subtle experience, this magnificent experience of the present moment of the heart that can't quite be, it can't be attained. It can't be really found. It's an uncovering of of what's already here. I do want to say that even though we are leaving this subtle body um, component right till the end, it's not as though we won't be doing practices with the subtle body throughout the training. Yeah, we so can't help ourselves. It'll it, inevitably be coming. It inevitably, in. all of this inevitably will overlap and, and, and we will be bringing il- elements here and there. So it's not as if like we're not going to mention prana until right at the end and no. like, now we're going to talk about prana. No, that's not quite it. We'll, we'll really go deeply into the, the, the subtle body and these um, more refined practices at, at the end of training, but throughout we'll definitely be um, interfacing with the subtle body. For sure. Uh, we're going to do a full segment on ceremony, set and setting, opening and closing the space, cleansing and protection practices, honouring the land and traditional custodians and etiquette, ceremony etiquette. Why we thought this was important because we see the yoga. Oh, excuse me. 
pardon me, etiquette. You are pardoned. <laughs> um, you know, what is a yoga class other than a ceremony? And to treat it in that way with reverence just brings so much more of a potency to the practice. And you will be able to feel it and the students will be able to feel it too. And there's, there's definitely... Uh, not right and wrong ways. Uh, there's definitely optimal and not optimal ways in um, running a ceremony, creating ceremony, mm-hmm. holding space. Yeah. Um, we. Saver. Are we also going to talk about our. Um, Were we also going to talk about our altar? Did we not bring in our yeah. altar? Altar so, and plant medicines. Oh, is that on the next page? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Dying before you die. No, that's so, the final no, one. Yeah. So savor. So <laughs> savor. <laughs> savor is selfless service, and this was a big part of. Ram Das's spiritual practice. And so we're really going to highlight this in our training in the form of a saver project. So we'll have quite a bit of time to come together and talk about potential projects that we can do within our families, within our communities. Um, you know, schools, rotary clubs, whatever, um, in order to bring our practice from the me to the we, from our own little sticky mat out into the out into the world. So this is a, um, as you like to say, where the rubber re- meets the road type of practice this is this is really an important part of it Mm -hmm. dying before you die is our final uh component in our final module so here we will be talking about Shavasana, revealing the true teacher within, death of the ego, plant medicine. We'll be talking about that a little, karma and the cycles of birth and death. So a nice one to finish on, a nice happy <laughs> way to finish. It may not seem happy, but it actually <laughs> is. Yeah, that's right. Those of you who... Um, I'm sure who follow us, who practice with us, know that this is uh, a huge part of our personal practice and belief, and some and and is unavoidable. Well, we we yeah. I'm not going to go. I'm actually not going to go too deep in it. I was about to go down. I was about to go down into a rabbit hole and I pulled myself out. <laughs> I'll, by go, the I'll ears. go down the rabbit hole instead. <laughs> You're gonna... Well, Shavasana. Shavasana in the modern day in a quick class is often so short and not a emphasized part of each class, yet I feel, and I know you feel, it, it can be the most important part of the class or at least one of the most important parts of the class. And it can be um, a practice of dying before you die. This uh, shavasana, corpse pose, uh, rather than it being just a brief restorative moment before uh, leaving class after moving and sweating, it, it can be a deep release into who we are beyond our ego. So, yeah, th- this is huge and it is Im- important and we really want to dive into it because, uh, 
I said the final frontier of the central axis, but with that is this dying before we die, which is for most people, again, especially in our culture where death isn't talked about so much and it tends to be hidden behind sanitized curtains and um, denied and avoided and yet I don't know I've just had my mind blown up and so many times uh, watching how you dealt with your parents death and observing Ramdas and his path of working with people dying and being in places like India and Bali and other cultures where they look at death uh, much differently. There's much more wisdom behind death, much more reverence about death. Mexico. And um, Mexico. And you look at most master wisdom teachers and wisdom traditions, and that's a huge part of the training is dying before we die again and again. And it's liberating for our own well-being and joy, but also great. It's very functional. It's one of the undeniable truths that we're all going to die. So we might as well deepen our skill set and our tools to die to, well. To die well. So that feels huge and also very functional to help us be better teachers as well. Um, I know when I'm taking myself too seriously as a teacher and I'm really in my role as a teacher and I got to, it's got to be the perfect class and what do they think about me and just that whole thing of the ego, the more we learn to die before we die, the less serious we take ourselves. Like in a good way, I think we can um, more easily get out of our own way and enjoy life, really. Yeah. Bit of a rabbit hole. But, you know. No, that was not a rabbit hole <laughs> at all. So that will bring us to the end of our training. We will have a graduation ceremony with um, all of our uh, guest teachers and special guests, and that feels like um, it's going to be a nice moment. And that brings us to the end of our year-long mm -hmm. training. So what yeah. do you think? What do you think? We can't wait to go on this journey with yeah. you all. Yeah. If you've still got any questions after all that, ask away. But I think that covered most of it. And yeah, we can't wait. September, it's going to be a big month. And yeah, it's not far away. So if you've been on the fence, um, just reach out and let's make it happen. <laughs> all right. Much love, everyone. Much love.